I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Maybe Here we something go. does Let me welcome our first speaker, Nia Walker on Between a Coral and a Hard Place. Nia earned her bachelor's degree in organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard. She is now a fourth year PhD student in the biology department at Stanford, where she uses genomics, genetics, and physiology to study corals, jellyfish, and anemones, often at Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey. When COVID allows, she plays violin with the Palo Alto Philharmonic Please welcome marine biologist and violinist, Nia Walker. Oh, thank you for that introduction, Tucker. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so today we are all going on a journey to explore the frustration, the complexity, and the optimism that is coral conservation. And in particular, I'm going to uh, discuss my work and my hope for harnessing coral resilience to better protect coral reefs in the future. Okay. I'm gonna begin by zooming out to acknowledge that climate change is severely impacting man-made and natural environments alike. For example, from droughts to California's wildfires to ocean warming and typhoons, um, environments are rapidly becoming more variable and more intense battlegrounds for organisms, and this makes climate change arguably one of the defining issues of our time. Fortunately, organisms don't just lay down and die when hit with adversity. Uh, we are all, from the tiniest bacteria to the largest animal on Earth, the blue whale, uh, equipped with tools to deal with stressors as they occur. The stress response is how all organisms survive variable and hostile environmental conditions. So resilience can be distilled down to an important and rather simple equation, which is that it equals the combined abilities to resist and slash or recover from stressors. And my dissertation is looking specifically into the temperature stress response in corals. So I'm doing this work in corals to study thermal, study thermal resistance and resi uh, resilience, sorry, uh, because ocean warming is arguably the most pressing climate change impact that coral reef ecosystems are facing. And I wanna expose you all more to what corals are facing now. So this photo progression represents an unfortunately common sequence of events concerning the world's coral reefs. This particular reef in American Samoa was perfectly healthy in 2014, then dying and decimated by mid-2015. And coral reefs are important because up to 25% of marine biodiversity is estimated to associate with them, and they bring in billions of dollars through the fisheries and tourism industries. And they also protect coastline or provide coastline protection against storm, strong storm surge waves. However, some estimates uh, state that 20% of all coral reef cover has already diminished over the last 30 years, and another 25% are at risk of quickly following suit. Now, in that middle photo, those dying corals are completely white, and this is a phenomenon known as coral bleaching, which is caused by ocean temperatures, rising ocean temperatures. But what is bleaching? So this is a diagram describing the process of coral bleaching, which goes from healthy colored coral to a completely sick white coral. And on the left, the healthy coral has color, not because of the coral itself, but because of the tiny plant-like algae uh, that live inside the corals and give them color. And those are all the green dots there. Um, and in the middle picture, the coral is stressed due to ocean warming and it starts to kick out the algae because the algae have turned from being helpful to actually poisonous inside the coral. And so that leads to the last picture, which is coral bleaching. And uh, the coral has completely kicked out all of the algae 
and they've gone to white because all you can see are the is the white skeleton underneath the like transparent animal skin. This is just to show you what those plant like algae look like under the microscope um, and the scientific term for them is dinoflagellate. I also like to show this picture because it helps to show the coral animal. Um, you can see the tentacles and uh, especially perhaps the resemblance to jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, plus you can see some of the transparent parts where the brown algae circles are not present. But what does this all amount to? This partnership between the coral animal and the plant-like algae is called a mutualistic symbiosis. So they give each other vital things for life, and some of those things are listed on this slide. For example, the coral gives the algae a home, while the algae gives the coral access to oxygen. And coral bleaching itself is the breakdown or the decoupling of this symbiosis. Keeps making that sound. I'm studying uh, coral thermal resilience by trying to understand how corals can resist bleaching, so keep their algae under stressful conditions or recover from bleaching, um, which means uh, surviving without them and then getting them back if they do bleach. I and other members of my lab conduct this resilience work in the Indo-Pacific archipelago nation of Palau where we collaborate with local researchers at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And that photo on the left is uh, taken right from the research station. So we're right on the water and it's just a really beautiful, vibrant place. We do heat stress experiments to study temperature resistance. And so this means that we go out into the field. Um, it'll be from like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the reefs diving and we collect small fragments from living coral colonies. So that's represented on the top left. And then we expose these colonies to high heat and temperature tank systems like what I'm showing in the big picture. And if you can see, they're like the tiny little corals all in those tanks. And then we score these corals in the system based on how much they've bleached which is shown on the bottom left. So from a scale of like totally colored, no bleaching to totally white, um, complete bleaching. And so we look at uh, how much they've bleached and also how long it takes to reach a certain level of bleaching. And we've learned quite a bit about heat resistance in corals. And I'll take you through a quick demo about this. Um, so, at high temperatures, we can see that uh, some corals bleached and others did not here. The ones that didn't are the high heat resistant corals. And we've seen this in our work and other labs around the world have seen this too. Um, and this has inspired many people to focus on protecting uh, the highest heat resistant corals. But as temperatures continue to rise, even the most resistant corals will be at risk. And so there's another piece to this puzzle, uh, which is that as oceans cool or corals adjust, some will completely recover while others will totally die. So there's a mystery here about whether a coral that's good at resisting and slash or recovering from bleaching is the best um, coral to prioritize for future coral reef restoration and protection. So this brings the coral field and my uh, research interests to a major question, which is do high heat resistant corals have lower recovery rates when they do eventually bleach? And I've been able to use the heat tank system that I showed before in Palau to force corals to bleach. Um, so that could take one day for a poor resistor or that could take 10 or more days for a really great resistor. And then I can ask how all of these corals are able to recover. And these are just some pictures of me uh, bleaching corals in a tank on the left and then putting them back out onto uh, their uh, original reefs to watch their recovery over time. So it's a, it's a pretty fun job. 
Here is one figure from my work showing that uh, the mortality results in corals during recovery. So from one week from, to four months after the artificial heating event, mortality during recovery differs very significantly depending on how resistant a coral was. In fact, I found that the highest heat resistant corals, so the ones in red, were two to three times more likely to survive during recovery compared to the lowest resistant corals that are in blue. But uh, when you look beyond death to see how the corals that are recovering are doing, you can see different patterns. And here I looked at how different corals were growing during recovery which is a way to evaluate health and uh, seeing how they did when they were returning to normal, basically. The corals in the middle are growing the fastest and actually low and high resistant corals don't grow at all at the four months into recovery. And if you look even closer at this figure, you can kind of see that um, not only are the low resistant corals, so the ones in blue, four months into their recovery, they're not growing, not only, sorry, not only are they not growing, but they're also smaller than when they started. So basically the average low resistant coral had four grams less density than they started with. And that kind of points to potentially, um, potentially like low resistant corals are more exposed to predation. So maybe fish are eating them more um, than they are the other ones. But also that might suggest that um, the skeletons themselves are more uh, brittle or more vulnerable to being knocked by a rock or by a really strong or powerful wave or all sorts of things. But it's really clear here to see that there's a really strong and striking pattern between the corals that I thought I was looking at, which were the low and high resistant ones, and the, the actual best performers, which were the moderate ones in the middle. And this is a possible theory, which is that there's a sweet spot of bleaching resistance and recovery. Perhaps the moderate resistors are the best at recovery, and this would actually be a huge shift in the field of coral conservation because currently the predominant theory is that uh, we should either prioritize the, the best resistors um, or the, the best recoverers. And this kind of puts all of that into question because the best resistors are not the best recoverers and the moderate resistors are the best recoverers. Just to summarize all of this a bit, as I've shown today, coral temperature resistance and recovery equals total resilience. Also, some corals are better at not bleaching and those corals are less likely to die if they do bleach. But on the flip side, when you force all the corals to bleach, um, so those that are really good at keeping their algae and really bad at it, um, and track their recovery over time, we see that the corals in the middle um, actually grew the best and maybe they're even recovering the best. So it's possible the middle corals will be the best corals for preserving uh, coral reefs in the future. And I'm really excited to see where my research goes. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated because this is one metric I'm looking at, um, but I'm also tracking how much those corals are eating over time. Um, how their algae are doing over time and I'm looking at their genetics. So it's this is a very small piece of the puzzle, but it's also a really promising and exciting uh, part of my work. OK, so if you only take away a few things from this talk, um, these are the things that I'm hoping you got, uh, which is that corals are animals and they form this symbiotic relationship with algae and coral bleaching is actually the breakdown of this relationship. And scientists like me can study coral bleaching resistance and recovery. And a lot of the time there's, there can be a disconnect or a perceived disconnect between what can you do with your research as a scientist and how can that lead to 
a real um, measurable change in conservation or in management and policy. And something that I'm really passionate about is, you know, making sure that my research is always um, impactful and uh, like directly applicable to like a real change. And so I've been really excited about uh, sharing these results with various different communities, but also communicating this work to um, local Palau and govern the local Palau and government and also um, some like government officials here as well. And you know, I've talked a lot about what I'm doing and what scientists are doing and what we can all do, but I want to turn it back and share a little bit about what you can do as well. And it turns out there's a lot. Um, so here's a graphic to capture some of those things any person can do. Um, you know, you can be, uh, you can practice safe boating and diving on reefs. You can educate yourself and others about coral reefs. You can choose sustainable seafood. You can support climate change and conservation initiatives. So that means, you know, not just at the government level, but uh, just like within your communities, et cetera. And you can also volunteer for opportunities um, like beach cleanups. And I think a really important thing to take away is that, you know, from a scientist to an everyday citizen, we all have an important role to play in, you know, not just conservation of coral reefs, but conservation of all of the world's ecosystems. And uh, to know that there's a lot of interplay and interaction and collaboration that happens between all of these various sectors um, of humanity. So there are many, many people to thank who have helped me uh, the last four years during my dissertation, uh, from my lab mates to Stanford to other collaborators in Palau and around the world and my funders. Um, but I really want to end here with uh, just thanking you for listening to my presentation and thanking Tucker and Wonderfest for putting this on. And please don't hesitate uh, to reach out if you have any further questions and comments. My uh, contact information is below. So I will stop there. <laughs> Great, Nia. Thank you. I, I, I see we have a lot of good questions. My knowledge of coral and coral survival is so basic though that maybe it makes sense for me to start with a question here. I, I just wonder if you could repeat one of the insights that you offered during your recent radio interview about regarding corals themselves, the living creatures, as being a sort of inverted or upside down other creature that some of us might be more familiar with. Will you please repeat that uh, analogy? Yeah, sure. And I can actually, I can show a different picture too. Um, yeah, so corals are related to jellyfish and to sea anemones. They're all in the same group of organisms. And so I like to consider a coral as literally an upside down jellyfish that is kind of glued its butt to the, the ocean floor. Um, but what I'm showing here are, um, this is basically what they look like. So like a coral animal, coral colony here is reduced to all of these like tiny soft body, bodied polyps. And um, yeah, so they have the same te tentacles and all the same parts as a jellyfish. And um, this large picture is just what the Great Barrier Reef looks like from outer space. And it's actually the only animal structure on earth that you can see from space. So it's pretty cool. Great, thanks Nia. Mm -hmm. I see Dwight Agan asks, what actual temperatures are you talking about? When we say temperatures that are lethal, for instance, to corals. Yeah, that's a great question. It depends on where you are in the world, um, but most coral reefs are found along the equator and they'll experience I'm trying to convert it to Fahrenheit because I, I work in Celsius, but um, so we'll like, we'll study corals that are like 30 degrees Celsius, which I think is 85 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. um, all the way up to like 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite hot. Like it feels like you're swimming in a bit of a hot tub, which is nice for us, but not great for the corals. Yeah. Rafi Overton asks also, how do the temperature changes needed to make them bleach compare to temperature changes in the oceans in recent decades? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we try to choose uh, temperatures in these experiments that are that they've either experienced in the past, so they'll mimic past bleaching, natural bleaching events that we've seen. 
um, like the one I mentioned that happened in 2015. Um, and then we'll also try to choose more extreme temperatures that are predicted to occur in the next 10 years. So currently what I'm doing, it's all um, temperatures that these corals have experienced in the past before. Good, good. Alan Winson asks, based on your results so far, would you say that the mid bleaching group is the only one to protect since the most resistant group does not recover? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, so this is like some preliminary work, but it does suggest that we should, rather than just protecting the highest resistant corals, that we should uh, consider how these corals do in recovery. And one way that this might influence conservation initiatives is by choosing corals from all of those different groups so that you have um, like a greater diversity of like fitness level, like coral fitness level and like overall ability um, represented. Because even though those uh, high resistant corals weren't growing as quickly and maybe they're struggling more, they're still um, also less likely to die than either of those other groups. So yeah, I think what we're currently recommending to um, officials is to choose corals from like a lot of different groups as opposed to focusing on one specific group, even if it is the, the moderate group too. Eric Yao asks, are there any other major factors that affect coral life cycle besides temperature? Yeah, so coral bleaching doesn't uh, just happen with temperature, but it's the most widely known uh, association with temperature. Um, bleaching can happen with like um, stress due to disease, due to um, like ocean acidification changes and things like that, um, or just like maybe the coral is having a bad day um, and wants to like try a different type of algae. So um, the corals are experiencing all sorts of different stresses, um, but coral bleaching is, or I'm sorry, ocean warming is the, the most common cause of coral bleaching today. Okay. Dwight Agan asks, are the coral reefs at risk off of California's coast? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the California coast does have corals, um, but they don't have coral reefs in the same way. Um, I mean, I guess if you go down to Baja, maybe, but they don't have coral reefs in like the way that we would think of the Great Bear Reef or like other reefs that are located on the Caribbean. So um, I guess another way to think about it is uh, besides the corals that are located uh, along the equator, where they make these large coral reef structures, there are corals that are located all over the world, so in the Arctic and um, in other temperate environments. Um, but these corals don't form coral reefs. So what this means is that even if we lose coral reefs, um, you know, we won't lose corals themselves, but we'll lose the, the ecosystems that they create. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, let's see, Victor Ochoa asks, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to coral conservation? Yeah, that, that's a really hard question. That's a good question. Um, so I would say the hardest thing is um, climate change um, policy, because you know, we're doing all of this work to breed stronger corals and prioritize reefs for uh, protection. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if we continue to, you know, not address like our really alarming levels of emissions, uh, the oceans will continue to warm and all of these corals will be um, very at risk of dying. <laughs> Thanks, Nia. My understanding of ecology is quite limited, but I think I grasp the concept of a keystone species. Mm -hmm. if, if that applies to coral, if coral is a keystone species, would you let us know and, and perhaps explain that concept? Yeah, so a keystone species um, is essentially an integral uh, species to like an ecosystem function. So like if you remove that, uh, organism from an ecosystem, the like entire ecosystem would change. And, um, you know, corals, you know, keystone species usually refer to like large animals or mammals and things like that. Um, like one example is like a shark or something like you remove sharks and that really changes um, like the function in terms of like how, how an ecosystem might work. And um, yeah, so 
I guess you, you can co sort of consider corals to be a keystone species because if you remove them, um, the entire ecosystem switches to something else or just totally degrades. Um, but yeah, we generally refer to keystone species as like uh, larger animals. Okay. <laughs> that was a round way, a roundabout yeah, way. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't think that the entire reef is maybe being uh, as a, a, species, a species type and, and then therefore keystone in the case of coral. Kathy Yao asks, are all the major reefs in the world in danger of coral bleaching, like the Coral Triangle and the Great Barrier Reef? Yeah, so all of the uh, reefs are in great danger, but it's to like a varying degree. So the reason why I do my work in Palau is that uh, these reefs are naturally um, like hotter than other reefs. So these corals have already been exposed um, over like thousands of years to really high temperatures. And so they've been shielded from some of the other like pretty massive and detrimental global bleaching events. Um, but yeah, even these corals that are exposed to like um, uncharacteristically hot water are, are at risk as well.